Heavenly Father, you are indeed holy, holy, holy. You are worthy. You are worthy of all of our attention as we sing your praises. You are worthy of all our attention as we worship you through attentiveness to your word. Would you now remove distractions, whether they be tech or whether they be something with us? I thank you for the wonderful musicians who served in both services, the deacons who served, and Lord, I thank you for the privilege of bringing your word this morning. And all of us, I'm confident, we don't want any of the glory. We just want to bring people closer to you. So we're relationally. Would you help us to focus on you? Because we know we bring stuff with us. We know we have things that we're worried about, things that are going on outside, things that are going on in our hearts and minds right now. And we ask you to help us to lay those things at your feet. And would you transform us by the renewing of our minds? Would you make us more like you, more like we were meant to be by the time we leave this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I got to begin with telling you that I had a gut punch this week. Uh, it wasn't because I'd been up too late the night before. It was actually a wonderful privilege to be at the Tulare King's Right to Life fundraising banquet. But uh, Friday morning, I slept in a little bit. I missed men's breakfast. Forgive me. I'm thankful for grace. Uh, but I had a little bit of truck problems, and I was making myself uh, a keto-friendly food, a little keto cracker. And I was sitting there, and I was doing something that I had once sworn off, I was listening to the news. Now, I had sworn off doing that because when you listen or when you watch, it's easier for your emotions to be manipulated, right? So I really like reading news so I can see their sources, make sure they're not telling me something that isn't true, see the context of everything. And it's a little easier to spot kind of emotive words that might lead you astray. But I was listening to the news, and I caught myself doing something I try not to do. I was already frustrated with the situation that we, we face in the world right now, right? There's lots of situations in the world, uh, but especially the whole pandemic and the response to it and the, and the way that things are going around uh, with war and, and all these issues around our world. And I was already upset, but I caught myself and I realized that I had moved while I was listening to some words of a politician and the words of some news commentators. I had moved from being upset at bad ideas to having malicious thoughts about people who I disagreed with. And I got hit with the gut punch that I was to obey Matthew 5.44, which is, But I say to you, these are the words of Jesus, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now let me be perfectly clear. I did not want to do that. I was honest with God. I prayed like a psalmist. I did respond in prayer, but my first thought was, God, I don't want to do this. I completely felt the conviction that I was to stop listening. And in fact, I walked away from the oven. And when I came back, I found that I had burned my cracker that I was making for myself. Uh, but I had to stop and I had to pray. Now, I don't know about you guys. I hope that you've encountered this moment where you feel convicted that you need to obey Scripture and it's not comfortable and it's not what you want to do, but you do it anyways. If you haven't, one of two things is happening. You are more holy than me, and I thank you that, you know, that you are blessed in that way. Or number two, you're not listening because <laughs> it happens quite frequently. But I knew I had stepped and aired out to some disobedience where I was actually hateful at a person instead of a bad idea. And in this divisive world, I knew what I needed to do. I needed to start praying. And so I prayed for politicians that I thought were breaking, and I think that are breaking the law, I prayed for commentators who I think are making the division worse. And then things started spiraling. And, and then I was even down to praying to people that, even from my past, that had just given me headaches, that I didn't realize that I was picking back up kind of my frustration with them instead of laying that thing at the feet of Jesus and praying for them. Because if God loved me and the knucklehead that I am, and certainly that I was before I knew him, I could love them. Now, I didn't pray for some of these people in the same way that I would pray for a loved family member uh, that is sick, right? Like I prayed for them to discover truth. I prayed for them to have wisdom. I prayed in some cases for them to repent, but I did pray. And like I said, I came back and I discovered that I had burnt my cracker, but it was more important to pause and pray. Now, how could I pray for these people that I was that upset with? Well, we're going to kind of pause the Holy Spirit convicted me and took me back to basics, and we typically do chapter by uh, chapter, by chapter, verse by verse around here. And we're going to go back into Ezra in about three weeks. We're going to finish this little mini kind of aside 
on the basics. And we're going to go back and we're going to go into Ezra and then Nehemiah because you just got to go those, you got to do those two together. And we've just done Philippians. But for now, we're going to look at kind of our, our mission statement for the church, for this church. And let me tell you, there's some confusion about vision and mission statements in churches, right? Like it's not, it's not the leadership's job to come up with something super, super clever and figure out what to do. We're just trying to follow what God wants us to do. We are trying to have a biblical mission statement. But there is sort of a, a distinctive emphasis here that I think makes us more unique in some ways than other churches. There are plenty of other good churches around here. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, is that there are some that have drifted from these basic principles. And these are things that we want to pursue very carefully and our characteristics of what we are doing here in our mission. So this is a way of memorizing the basic tasks that every church has and, and our kind of purpose for existing. We are pursuing depth in love, depth in truth, depth in life. Now, these three are separate but connected ideas. And so we're going to take the next three weeks to talk about these ideas. But I got to begin with depth in love. You see, there are really three parts to love, but we need to, we need to define it. Love, what kind of love? Well, love from God and then love to our fellow believers. But then really I want to focus today on love to those outside. It's almost like this mission statement is, is walking us through, in kind of modern language, what we hear about in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, and we'll get there. But the idea of making disciples. We are going to love those outside of this body and let them know the good news of Jesus because we're responding to his love. And then we're going to give real truth, not just shallow surface level stuff. And then we're going to learn how to do life together in a community, right? So depth in our life together. And that's one of the things that I think is really important. Unfortunately, the reality is, is that there are many people that are satisfied with kind of a surface level love or a surface level Christian life where, you know, I've got fireproof insurance here and I, I, I come to church every once in a while or I feel a pew, but man, there's no passion and excitement in that. And if we truly understand verses like this, I think it will ignite a passion in us. Let's look at Matthew 23, verse 37. This is Jesus talking. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Understanding the love of God begins with realizing that Jesus was saying this to people he loved that would betray him, that were fickle and would shout Hosanna, that is God save us at the beginning of the week and at the end of the week shout crucify him, crucify him. These are people that he knew, he didn't cause, but he allowed to walk their own path, to walk away from him and get themselves in trouble and even impact others. This was his love for the enemies, those that participated in a rebellion against their creator. And even more shocking, if you understand that love correctly, you understand not only did God love his enemies, but we're one of those enemies. We have been one of those enemies. Hopefully we're not now. We've been one of them. And God desires, Jesus desired to this people who he's looking over this whole city, he desired to do something like this. If you look at this little image, you can see two cute little chicks popping out from their mother's wings. Jesus wanted to take himself and cover them and shield them from all harm. He wanted to love and protect them and guide them. And I don't know about you, but I can remember, you know, it's been a while. Yesterday was the anniversary of 9-11. And so I remembered that 20 years ago, I was still in high school. So I'm younger than some of you guys. And I remember that impact. It's been a while since my parents were loving me by doing something that I really didn't want them to do or telling me something I didn't want them to tell me. But I can still remember that. But there is love there. Jesus wanted to shield us with himself. And ultimately, he would do it. Those of us that have come to faith in Jesus, and faith is that continued trust that we have in him for the payment of all the accidental and intentional wrongdoings we've done in our life. He will. He'll cover us with borrowed robes of righteousness, his good deeds. I mean, we're not in this building because we're smarter than everybody else. Maybe we know something that they don't outside these walls, but we're not in this building because, you know, we are more holy or that we've got everything figured out or are naturally more moral. God is the one who's called us and he's drawn us in and he has equipped us and covered us with his righteousness. Now, where it all starts is this, 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. That's why we're up here singing. 
That's why we're up here sharing God's word. That's why we do service projects in the community. That's why we're giving to missionaries, because we are astounded by God's love for us. Because he knows what's in our heads. He knows those thoughts that you don't share with anybody else, not even your spouse. And he still loves you. And that is powerful. And even when we are thinking of this verse in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's not just an obligation if we truly have depth in love. It's not like we're just checking a box. We want to obey Jesus because we want to be closer to the person we love. And that is the desire I have. That is the desire I hope you have to get closer and more in line with Jesus because we love him. Now, we got to define what this love is, especially when God talks about love. These past two verses I've shared with you that have used the word love, in Greek it is used the word agape. Now, in Greek there are different types of love, and you probably have heard this before. It was even a Super Bowl commercial a couple of years ago where they explain these things. But let's look at them. Greek Gateway is the website that uh, just kind of teaches people a little bit of Greek, and it defines these four main types of love this way. Storge is affection, love between family, you know, like the way you might feel for a cousin or an uncle or, or something like that. Philia, it can be described as brotherly love, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. But it really refers to friendship, like a bond. Like I have a few friends that even though if I haven't talked to them in years, I can call them up and we could pick up our conversation where we left off years ago. And that is really wonderful. And then Eros. Well, that's a fun one to talk about from a church stage, right? Like if I don't talk about it, you're missing out on something really important. If I talk about it too much, you might get uncomfortable. But there is an appropriate place for eros, love inside of a marriage, sexual love. And it's meant to be one man, one woman for one lifetime. And we know that people have missed that here for one reason or another. We have divorced people in our midst. We have people that erred before they got married. But that's what God desires for us. And it's good when it's in the right place. But then we come to agape. Agape is the unconditional love of God. And that's the word that God has been using here and inspiring the authors of Scripture to use. Now, if you've heard me talk about love a lot, you've probably heard me talk about my kids and how I teach them agape. I don't want them to get the wrong idea when I say, son, daughter, I love you. I don't want them to think, I love you just when you're behaving. I love you just when you're doing what I say. Or I love you when you're not grounded. This always gets me because there was a specific time, and it did bring tears to my eyes. Uh, I had grounded my son, and I said, you know, I agape to you. Do you remember what that means? And he said, oh, you know, he almost like rolled his eyes. You love me. You love me the most possible. Even though I'm grounded, you still love me. And I, oh, he got it. Because this world is fickle. I want more for my children than the fickle kind of love where you have to chase it all the time. That's not good enough. That's not godly love. I want them to be loved, and I want them to know that God loves them even more than I do. But I want them to have that firm foundation that they can build upon, that no matter what they do, yeah, there's going to be consequences, but I'm not going to stop loving them because I want them to know that God is the same way. God does not love us more when we obey him better. God does not love us less when we disobey. And you know what? If you really understand that, that actually inspires you to obey more, to be closer, when you realize it's not conditional. You want that. And love in general is a very important topic in the New Testament, especially to the author John. And we're going to look at, we've looked at First John chapter 4. We're going to look at that again. We're going to look at a passage in the Gospel of John. But John is called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, John, of course, isn't the only one who Jesus loved, right? But John identified with that. He really connected with that. And he says this, and this is 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved. So he starts with beloved and he continues with love. Let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. That's pretty serious, for God is love. But this, the love of God was manifested in us. Oh, I'm sorry, by this. The love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten. The Greek there is monogenes, one of a kind. Those of you that become Christians or are Christians, uh, maybe you're listening to this later, maybe you're a guest here and you're not a Christian. We sometimes get confused in our culture and like everybody's a child of God. Actually, if you read the New Testament, no, only those that are adopted in become sons and daughters of God. 
but we are always adopted. Jesus is the monogenes, one of a kind, only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to, the, to be the propitiation, big fancy word, payment in our place for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, I promise I'm not some hippie, right? I know that's been a while since hippies were a thing, but love is very important, and we can't let our culture's weird ideas impact what we think love is. We need to follow what God is saying about love. Our culture has lots of weird ideas. Let me begin by saying that God didn't need us to love him. He, isn't, or he wasn't waiting around in eternity waiting for someone to love. God had perfect love in the Trinity. God and his overabundance of love created us, and he loved us. But it's not like he's getting um, something that he really needs from us. But he is pouring over love for us. It's for our good. And it's not like he looked down and, man, wow, those people are really lovable. You ever see something that looks really cute and you just want to cuddle it? That is not how our sins look, okay? They look pretty ugly. But God still loved, and he loves us. And it even says God is love, the same way it says Jesus is truth, the light, and the way. We know God is also called righteousness. But our culture today has flipped things around. They treat it like a math problem when they look at this verse, and even some uh, so-called liberal, and I'm talking theologically liberal, theologians have said things like, oh, if God is love, that means love is God. Let's address that so we don't get sidetracked when we talk about what love is. This is not a transitive uh, math problem, okay? We can't just switch the words around and make it mean the same thing. It's not like two plus three, and then we can just switch places. No, this is actually a qualitative type of statement. So author Elliot Miller at the Christian Research Institute, he does a better job at researching this, the Greek language, which I know a few words in, but certainly can't read, uh, and just the way it's been tracked throughout the centuries. And he responds to this more recent idea that love is God, and, and it's often used to just excuse all kinds of things that mean well, but makes an attribute an idol. You see, when it says God is love, it's saying that God's quality, his essence, is where love flows from. Just like all truth flows from God. But love is not a person. Love is a feeling or an action that comes from a person. It's not in itself an agent that does something. And so we need to remember that. Very often when people say love is God, or, or whether they know it or not, or maybe they don't use that phrase, but they make love this big thing, they, oh, they make it into this idol, they actually mean a very shallow kind of love. The kind of love that says, well, love is love, and I'm going to let them do what they want, and I'm never going to tell them what they're doing is wrong, that has more in common with apathy than agape. Really loving someone means sometimes, in a loving way, confronting them with the truth. I love my children, and so I don't let them play, with, play uh, in traffic, even if they think it would be fun, right? There are consequences and there are dangers, so I don't let them get into trouble. Now, in the end, of course, they do have some free will, and my kids will do things that I tell them not to do. We have free will, and we're going to do some things that God tells us not to do, but he's telling us those things out of love, and as his body, as his ambassadors on this earth, we need to be telling people in love the truth. Real love tells the truth. Brett Kunkel, founder of Maven, he, he kind of altered, there's a book, and it's actually based on an Alexander uh, Solzhenitsyn quote that says, live not, by li live not by lives, live not by lies. I'm going to get it right in just a second. Uh, he altered that quote recently on Facebook, and I really love that he says, love not by lies. It's not loving to buy into somebody else's delusion, right? That's not a good thing. So depth in love means more than just wanting someone to be happy. It means wanting them to be free of false ideas, right? And that starts right here. We often, and I'll come back to this in a couple of weeks, uh, to be honest with you, I could have probably made that statement say, depth in love, depth in truth, and depth in love together, or, you know, love twice in some way. So we'll come back to love inside the body and how we live together in two weeks. But did you realize that the 1 Corinthians 13 passage we always use at weddings, it's actually talking about a community of believers. 
It's how we're supposed to be in church. It's how we're supposed to be treating one another in church. It's not just about a marriage. But let's hear from John again about how important it is. This time, the Gospel of John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So important. And how did he say to love? Like I have loved you. How did Jesus love people? He told them the truth. He died for them. It was self-sacrificial. It wasn't lifting himself up inappropriately, but he was being a servant. What if we all loved each other like that? Then the world would look in this world where, you know, the iPad and, and, and iPhone and Facebook and all this stuff and Twitter and Snapchat and TikTok and whatever else, that is the stand-in for real community. They would look at us and see, wow, there's a community that really does deeply love one another. And they would hunger for that because we were made to live in community. But as we think about depth and love, God wants us to have depth and love for one another because he has a mission for us. So that depth in love, it has a purpose. It continues past just loving one another. Jesus didn't gather his disciples while he was alive. And then once he got his, you know, set amount of disciples, first the 12 and then the 70 and those that are following around those, he didn't just gather them together. All right, we've got a good amount of people. Let's hang out and let's just fellowship. Fellowship is that nice Christian word where we encourage one another. We often do it around food because that's incredibly important. But he did something else. He actually modeled and he trained them to be about his mission. And his mission included loving other people, including loving people that seemed unlovable. And you might say, oh, Sam, you're talking about evangelism. Evangelism is scary. I know that. I've knocked on doors. I've done that style of evangelism. God doesn't call many to that, but I've done that. And it was terrifying every single time. But it's really important. We're going to start off in a kind of scary way. But don't worry. I'll give you some more basic steps you don't always get called to do this one, but I want you to know that the deeper you go into love, the more it might look like this. Let's start with one of my favorite passages on evangelism, which I don't think other people think is about evangelism. Let's look at Mark 5.1. They came to the other side of the sea, this is the Sea of Galilee, and to the country of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately, now note they, so there's disciples with him here, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. I did a funeral this week of a man younger than me. I always kind of take note when people younger than me, I'm doing their funeral, right? Cemeteries can be a sad place, or they can be a setting for a horror movie. But think about this man. We learned from the other Gospels this man was roaming around naked. Do you think that society thought he was salvageable? That there was anything good could come out of him? Had they tried? They had tried before. It wasn't like they immediately went to not caring. They had tried, and yet here he was. What do you think the disciples thought? Now, wait, we picked up the tax collector. He's now hanging out with us. You know, we picked up this political zealot. He's hanging out with us. Oh, is the Lord going to make this guy hang out with us too? His dirty feet is, are going to destroy our boat. Or he's hanging out there naked. He's not modest enough for us to talk to. What do they think? Now, obviously, he didn't stay with them long term. But Jesus took the time that he was with this man and made an impact. And it is possible that this was a Gentile. He might have went out of his way to kind of set the stage for when the church was really going to bloom outside of the people of Israel. Now, Jesus loved this man. And you probably don't have to think far because of our homeless situation to think of people that it's a little harder to love or that look a little crazy. I mean, there's somebody who I have talked with and I've given food to that I often see right here on the street corner by the church who will stare at the sun shirtless and foam at the mouth. I have no idea what drugs he's on. But as much as I get frustrated with the homeless breaking things around the building and, and things like that, I, we do have that happen here. I am reminded and convicted that person is made in God's image and God loves them. 
doesn't mean I want to enable their continued bad behavior or lifestyle, but I do want them to come to know Jesus. So look what happens. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other? Jesus, Son of the Most High God. What a testimony. Son, same kind as. He's recognizing that Jesus is God. I implore you by God, he means God the Father here, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swines that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus, observed the man who had been demon-possessed, setting down, clothed, I bet they were happy about that, and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they became frightened. Now, we could spend a lot of time on that passage, and maybe another day I will. We don't know for sure. It, it was probably in the area towards the Decapolis, so it was very likely Gentiles. Some have said that actually there was Jewish people in the area, and maybe the reason Jesus let the pigs get destroyed is because they weren't supposed to have pigs, right? We don't know all the details, but I'm convinced Jesus did, and he knew what he was doing. But he wasn't worried about the economic impact in the area. His primary goal was seeing this man freed. Now, the crazy people that you know, they may not be in physical chains. But ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have victims. They might be in chains. Ones that you can't see, but very much constrict them. If we have the love of God, we can recognize, man, he freed me from a lot of bad ideas. He freed me from loneliness, depression. He freed me from not having a purpose. He did so much for me. I want to pass that on to other people. And if we feel that way, well, sometimes we get called to deal with somebody a little scary. Now, it doesn't always start that way, right? So I want to give you something a little bit more basic. Maybe God isn't going to call you to deal with somebody who's running around naked in a cemetery. In fact, I kind of hope he doesn't right now. Like, you need to grow in maturity to get to that point. But if God calls you to it, I hope you'd be ready. But let's look at what Romans says. It's so important. Jesus isn't on a boat around in Galilee right now, okay? We're far away, and we now are the body of Christ. We are the ambassadors for him. So Romans 10, 14 says this. How then will they call on him, Jesus, whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Not a pastor, preacher. We are a priesthood of royal believers. This is everybody, anyone who's declaring the truth. How will they preach unless they are sent, just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, and I have to include this part so you don't get discouraged when somebody doesn't respond. Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Some won't respond. Some won't respond to what should be obvious to them already. When I'm talking to a lost person, I often start with, hey, can I get a common ground? What do you know? There's enough evidence out there that they should know that there is a creator. And we can start from there. But some don't. Some reject even that. Wherever they are, Jesus met them exactly where they are. But don't be discouraged. Our job is not to drag them kicking and screaming into the kingdom. Our job as ambassadors is to make sure that they have heard the truth. That like James says, that we're being living epistles read by all men. And so if we love God, if we're obeying his commands, that means we've got to make sure that we are sharing with other people. And we recognize here at the Fountain, and it's part of our DNA, something called organic outreach. And it's part of what we see in the Greek of Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. In the Greek, it's not very clear in the English, but in the Greek, this is an active, ongoing tense and probably should be translated, I'm really confident it should be translated this way, as you are going, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
Whether you're called to knock on doors or stand on a street corner, or I, I think Mike Rasmussen already left. He's done some amazing ministry uh, amongst gang members and things like that, and I really appreciate that. We're all called, even if we're not gifted as evangelists, to, as we are going, organically outreach to the people around us. We should be scattering seed, the news, the good news about who God is. We should be letting it grow. And then we should be continuing to plant. Now, it could look differently. Maybe you're not going to a cemetery, but maybe you're asking, how can I pray for you? Maybe you're saying in your conversation, hey, I'm really thankful for this amazing book I just read. Would you like, to, would you like a copy? However it might be, you could be reaching out. It should not take a CSI investigation team to determine that you are a Christian or that you care about other people being a Christian. One simple way to begin evangelism is just this. Know some lost people? Invite them to your house for food. Seriously. Fellowship is incredibly important. Actually care about them. Actually listen to what they have to say. Have them over. Show them that you care. Can't cook? That's okay. You can order take-in, right? Or, or dine-in, whatever. Take-out. Show them. Really listen to, you, to them. And then at some point, you need to take them deeper. Judean Missions is a ministry that it's based out of Tennessee. Ryan Rebold was the founder. He had discovered that 9 out of 10 Christians had never shared their faith with anyone. That was a shocker to him. So he wrote a book called Nothing But Faith in My Pocket, and he actually went around and kind of lived as a homeless person across the U.S., just trying to share his faith with other people. And afterwards, he started up this mission, and I got to go on one of the trips with him in Louisville and do some of that kind of thing. But it was a stunning admission. And we find uh, the Billy Graham organization, Billy Graham Association, they issued a statistic a couple of years ago that 70 to 85 percent of those in church now were invited by a relative or friend. Oh, if my grandfather had not passed away and had consistently lived out the Christian life in front of me, what would have happened to me? It was because of him that I wanted to go to church. Or my friend Tommy, he wanted to invite me to a Christian concert. What if I hadn't seen him consistently praying over his food, being nice to everyone, being curious and going, well, I, I guess I could just check out the music. What about those people in my life? Had they never been there, what would have happened to me? Whew, scary thought. I want to make sure I'm going to be that person for somebody else. So invite them for food. Invite them, eventually maybe, to hear a song, music, small group. Invite them in, and then eventually draw them in. You know, they, they found that every, the average Christian can identify seven unchurched people that they have a personal relationship with, co-worker, brother, sister, cousin. And they conducted a national survey, and it says 82% of the non-church, now, admitted this was before COVID, I understand that that's a current concern. That's why we are also online. They said they would come to church with a friend or relative if invited. They're doing this thing now called micro church, where they said, hey, we're watching, we're watching this online church thing. Why don't you come to our house? We'll bring pizza, and it's in somebody's home. You know, our, we'll have pizza for you, and you can watch it with us. And that is a new thing that people are comfortable with. They might not be comfortable with a big crowd. Well, I know you're safe. All these different ways of pulling people in and helping them be set free from the false ideas. Now, I'm not asking you to identify all seven of those people and to chase them all down this year, right? Identify one. Start praying for them. Start inviting. Start building a relationship with them. Because I have to close with this. How will they believe in him who they have not heard? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we recognize, those of us that are Christians, we have the privilege of being your ambassadors to this crazy world. I know I myself, and I'm sure many of these others here, have a long testimony of what you have done in our lives. Help us to get past whatever might be stopping us from sharing it with others. Help us to share with others the depth of your love. Help us to have the depth of that love towards other people and to see them the way you see them. Because this world so desperately needs you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.